In the emergency department, we frequently have to deal with patients who are agitated or aggressive and who have the real potential to act violently. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why someone might be in this state. Whatever the cause, the situation poses one of the most challenging communication scenarios that we face in all of medicine. Ultimately, our task is to keep everyone safe. Staff, other patients, yourself, and of course the agitated patient themselves. How we approach these patients, the initial impression we make, and the trust that we build in those first few moments of interacting with them will have a huge impact on how their stay in our care will pan out. I'd like to share some lessons that I've learned, mostly the hard way, and that I try to remember to apply whenever I'm faced with this situation. And to start the series, I'm gonna talk about what I believe to be the most important step, and that is preparation. How do you prepare your mind, your staff, and your environment to give yourself the best chance of building trust with the agitated and potentially violent patient? The first thing I wanna talk about is preparing your mind. And the first mindset or, or frame that I wanna discuss is the fact that this person, this person in front of you who is behaving so badly, this is someone's son or someone's daughter. Keeping this frame in mind has really helped to remind myself of my own kids. And even though I hope that they would never end up in a spot like this, I guess if they ever did, my hope is that they would be treated with dignity and respect and compassion. Another frame that I've found really useful in this situation is remembering that this person, this person in front of me, has almost certainly had an incredibly tough life. We usually don't get a chance to speak to these patients at length in the emergency department. It's just too busy. But what I've found when I do is that these people have almost always had traumatic childhoods, are financially disadvantaged, and are faced with circumstances that make each day a real battle just to survive. Another frame that I find useful is remembering that under different circumstances, this could have been me. I feel extremely fortunate that I had the kind of upbringing that afforded me the opportunity to become an emergency physician. I mean, how lucky am I? Another important perspective that I try to take into these conversations is that from this person's point of view, everything right now looks like a threat. So from my perspective, I need to expect to be attacked. Not necessarily physically, but certainly emotionally and verbally. And the thing is that if I'm expecting that, if I know that I'm walking into a situation which has a high likelihood of trouble, then I'm much less likely to be thrown by it when it comes my way. The other thing that this helps me with is it helps me remember that any anger or aggression is likely to be driven by fear. And that just, that just helps me reframe that anger or rage that I might see when someone rings on my doorbell while I'm trying to film a video. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, so now I want to talk about how I think about preparing my staff. Because you're always, hopefully, going to be facing these kind of situations as a team. Or at least you should be. Because if you're walking into this kind of stuff by yourself with no one else knowing that you're there, that's a recipe for trouble. Okay, so the first thing I do in terms of preparing my staff is that I share my perspective. And that might sound a little bit like this. Hey guys, look. I just want to acknowledge that our first priority has to be safety here. I recognize that there is a very high chance that we're going to cop a little bit of verbal abuse. I also want to acknowledge that this person is someone's son. Almost certainly it's someone's brother and it could be someone's dad. And our role today is to care for that person and to make sure that everyone is safe. The second thing I do to help prepare my staff is that I share my plan. And that might sound something a bit like this. Okay guys, so I'm gonna go in and see how I go just building a little bit of trust with this person. 
The third thing I do to help prepare my staff is that I keep in mind the principle that I want support, but I do not want spectators. And if there's anyone here who's just watching and who, who doesn't need to be here, I'd really like you to move away from the area, please. It'll just make it a little bit easier for me to build trust with this person if there's not people watching or spectating. So I really appreciate your cooperation with that. Thanks guys. The more people who are standing around watching, the higher the stakes and the more pride there is to protect. And the higher the risk of losing face if someone has to make a compromise. Now I want to make this space real safe for compromise. And I'm not just talking about the patient. Taking spectators out of the picture also takes the pressure off me. That said, I generally do like to have some heavy duty support close at hand. I just try to find the right balance where they can be present, but not giving the patient the impression that they're standing over them. I'd like you to stay within my line of sight, but just not so close that they feel threatened by your presence. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about preparing the environment. The first valuable thing you can do here is just lower the stimuli. And I'm talking about lowering the light, lowering the sound and the noise if you can. Now this isn't easy in the emergency department, but I've found that even small increments can help. The next thing to think about is exit control. Make sure no one feels trapped. I try to maintain my awareness of physical exits from the treatment space relative to where I am myself and also to where the patient is situated. Access to an exit is obviously important to me, just in case things escalate and I need to remove myself from the situation immediately. But it's also important that I don't appear to be blocking an exit for the patient. The last thing I try to be sure about is that any potential weapons are removed from the area. This includes any furnishings that can be picked up and thrown, as well as any sharp items in the vicinity. I also try to make a point of removing my stethoscope from around my neck and either leaving it outside the cubicle or putting it in my pocket. I can't stress enough how valuable I found this preparation to be in my dealings with potentially aggressive patients. Look, it is a bit of an upfront investment in time and effort, but I inevitably find that the trust that buys me with a patient saves both of us from time consuming and restrictive interventions down the track. And honestly, the most important part of all of this, I think, is the way I prepare my mind. The frame that I take into a conversation like this is inevitably what will drive my behavior and my responses in the moment. Now, there's a concept that I love from the book Thanks for the Feedback by Sheila Heen and Douglas Stone, and that is the concept of the leaky face. I know that if, even if I go in and, and use exactly the right words, my real intentions and my real attitude and my real perspective, my real frame of the situation is gonna leak through in my tone and in my facial expressions and in my body language. I've always got in the back of my mind that when people are in the grip of acute paranoia and fear, they are particularly attuned to inauthenticity. So if I can't say something genuine, I know that I'm I'm just better off not saying it at all. Two more things. I just want to reiterate, these are not superpowers. Ouch. They will not work 100% of the time. It is always important that we don't overestimate our ability to talk down agitated patients and put ourselves or others at risk. And finally, I just want to pay homage to the paramedics and the emergency services staff who have to deal with these kind of situations in the wild that is outside of the relatively controlled environment of the hospital. You guys, I mean, seriously, you guys are the real heroes of critical communication. So thank you. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the enormous value of cognitive frames, you should definitely check out this video here where I discuss more of the reasons why we just can't afford to ignore frames as an essential part of the communication toolkit. If you have any suggestions or tips for how you manage people in aggressive states, whether you agree or disagree with me, I'd love to hear from you. Just leave your thoughts in the comments section below. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.